actually began in our kitchen. I was talking to my wife. I told her that Auburn needs a symphony orchestra. She looked at me and said, what are you trying to get yourself into this time? I brought the idea to a group of townspeople, Bob Ding's wonderful man, cellist, was part of that meeting. He stood up in a very loud voice and said, this will not work. We've tried it before and you're wasting your time. And immediately following that, Marilyn Gelbach, who was Doc Gelbach's uh, dearly loved and departed wife, stood up and said, well, Bob, I don't think you're right. I think this will work and I'm going to help. We met for the first time in September of 1988 and laid out a, a timeline, set a concert date for May of 1989, a date for a first rehearsal in January and set about to find a conductor. I believe there was five or seven conductors, I'm not sure which one, might be seven, uh, auditioning, and I, I was one of them. We actually had eight people apply. I don't remember all of the names, but chief among them was Clyde Quick. Clyde Quick was the high school music teacher at that time, so he was the natural choice of uh, directing an Auburn Civic Symphony. And when he came to the interview, he laid out his first program for us. That impressed us. And then I got the job. We hired Clyde then began to discuss how to recruit musicians. And we basically put a music announcement in the Auburn Journal. I first heard about the orchestra forming, probably from Monroe DeJarnet, um, who was gathering people together. I think it was also in the Auburn Journal. I was raising three babies at the time, and this newspaper article came out, big, you know, big front page, the birth of an orchestra, and I said, oh my God, I have to do this. I saw an ad in the Auburn Journal, and I had, my husband and I had moved to Auburn from the Bay Area in the late 70s, um, and learning to play in public school, I played in orchestras and a lot of pit orchestras for musicals down there. So when we moved to, Auburn, what I really missed was an outlet for me to be able to continue playing my violin. What drew me to the orchestra was that I loved to play flute and I had heard that they were starting up an orchestra. Um, so I, even though I had to audition, which was new for me, I uh, auditioned and made it. I had the music already in the folders. We passed out the folders and had our first rehearsal and the paper reported that the birth of the orchestra, the orchestra sounded its first yell. <laughs> I think some of the challenges of the orchestra in the beginning were um, having musicians that were all able to play the music, first of all. We had some very fine musicians, but we were brand new, so we all had to gel and learn, uh, learn how we could present this music in a beautiful way. The very first performance, we had a full house. I think we had almost 600 people, probably right around 500 people in attendance. So that opening concert, the lead up to it, was just so exciting to see 
the amount of publicity, the people who were asking questions about it, uh, the people who wanted to come and see this new thing that was happening in Auburn. It was really an exciting thing. Our premier concert was incredible. And I was scared to death, and, and many of us were scared because we'd never really performed all together before. And at the end, we were hoping that they would clap, and instead they, they all jumped out of their seats and screamed, and it was wonderful. And from that time, I was hooked, totally hooked. <laughs> and when it came together, it took a lot of work. Uh, Monroe, uh, Dejanet, uh, really, poured his soul into this, and Clyde Quick poured his soul into making this happen. Um, and there were a lot of community members who volunteered and helped. To put together the orchestra, we quickly um, realized uh, that it's not just the musicians. We had the driving force behind it. We had Monroe and Bruce who wanted to put together this, this orchestra, and we had Clyde Quick who was willing to conduct. But behind that, there were also volunteers that had to take care of a lot of the details. There are so many details behind the scenes and everybody's needed. Well, what I remember about the first days of the Auburn Civic Symphony was that everybody had a job. In the early years, we were work, working out of paper boxes. We were small, it was in our home, there was certainly no office. We um, just everybody did their part to put things together and behind the scenes we had a lot of volunteers that did not only the administrative aspects but also started working towards raising some funds to put this together. Um, I couldn't tell you exactly what year it was but our league was formed which was our support group and they helped do an awful lot with fundraising and making cookies for the orchestra and helping to make us feel comfortable and, and the musicians feel wel more welcome. Then later I took on the job of Juice Queen. And I was a conductor of the symphony for seven years. Um, it was from the, the first year was basically one concert, which was in the spring. And then we had at that point already put together the program for the following year and had started to publicize and put out a brochure about what was the, the orchestra was and the, the initial premier concert just sort of established we have a concert here, we have an orchestra here in Auburn. And um, then the next year we had our full concert season which was probably basically three complete concerts. I think working with Clyde Quick was just wonderful. He, Clyde was so, is such a nice person. He was a very pleasant to be around. Um, one of his gifts that helped our symphony was um, his ability to choose some wonderful pieces of music which the symphony was able to buy to start our, our great library of music that we have. So he chose, he chose some um, well-known symphonies that um, were appealing to the audience and most importantly, no not most importantly, but also importantly, um, they were satisfying for us musicians to play. With Clyde as our conductor, he, he, he brought us through the infancy stage. He brought us through the very beginning. It was like the birth of the orchestra where we came to a certain point. When he was going to retire, we were very nervous. We had no idea what to expect. We were very comfortable with Clyde. Um, and suddenly we learned that we had this British fellow coming to conduct us, for which we knew nothing. We needed a, a new figurehead, so we formed a committee from the orchestra, sent out letters to various newspapers and uh, conductors, and received 16 applications for the post as conductor of the Auburn Symphony. We, uh, we uh, auditioned four of them, and one of them, of course, was Michael Goodwin. Michael was kind of like our refinement period. He was hired, and uh, the change was wonderful. He, he raised the bar on expectation of the musicians, and we rose to that. Michael had a gift for 
comprehending the music and the musician. And he set about getting the best out of all of us. Uh, we grew in so many different ways with Michael at the helm. He just, he brought that out of us with his wit and his, um, his knowledge. I mean, he was just, a, had an amazing knowledge base and he shared that with us. When he introduced a piece called Tristan and I, Tristan and Isold. And when we first started practicing it, I was wondering, how on earth are we gonna make this sound good? And then you go through the rehearsal and he takes you and he teaches you how to understand the music. And I remember when we played that piece, it was like an out of body experience because you remember what it was like the first time you played it, very difficult piece to pull together. And then you're sitting on stage and you're actually performing it and you're going, this is absolutely beautiful. And I think that tied it all together is how how the rehearsal brings it all together for the performance and it helps you understand the music and Michael helped us do that. Had his music in his head, he didn't need a score so that his rehearsals were concise, very much to the point, and he was right. And we recognized that. He drew a lot of fine musicians from the area. And we still have musicians coming from, a few coming from Davis, uh, several coming from Sacramento and the uh, Grass Valley, Nevada City area. So he, we, we improved in that way also. I love Michael's gentle musicianship. He asked us to play musically always. He would tell us stories. Um, he would stop the, the whole, everybody would just come to a stop and he'd say, okay, do you all know what really goes on here? And then he would tell us the backstory of the, if it was an opera or whatever, we were a, in a raging ocean. He says, this is what the music is supposed to feel like. So rather than tell us to play notes, he told us to play emotions. And it was uh, just a wonderful experience. And his sense of humor, it was sharp, biting sometimes, but uh, you know, it was, uh, it was really terrific. We were thrilled to be able to play at Mandavi uh, for the first time. It was such a different sound. It was sort of awesome, like being in a cathedral. The sound there was absolutely amazing. You could actually hear everyone play. I remember a trombone player telling me that, wow, he'd never heard the violins before. You know, but here we've all been playing for years, but just because of the sound, the dynamic was absolutely amazing. And then to see that vast number, I mean, we went from an audience of potential, what, 588 people to 1,800. I recall when uh, we first were able to go over to play in, at Mondavi. It's a magnificent hall, a huge stage, plenty of elbow room. We were no longer crowded. We could hear each other very, very well. And it was an exciting, exciting experience. Michael raised his baton for the first downbeat, and we played that first note. And I remember everybody just sat there going, oh my gosh, you could hear the note. You could tell the difference in a professional concert hall because the note was just singing throughout Mandavi. And we just, we actually sat there in awe thinking, woo, this is pretty cool. Even though the full orchestra would play with sometimes very loud passages, but the acoustics were so good you could hear every note you played individually. And in some ways that was terrifying because it didn't seem like there was, a, there was anywhere to hide. And Michael, when he conducted, um, showed his emotions. So if, he, if, if we were playing well, which we usually did, <laughs> he showed his emotions. And I remember the first time I just kind of saw tears coming from his eyes. And, he, he was so moved by the music. And Mondavi is a wonderful venue. We, we, you know, we, we sound really well, I think, in Mondavi. I believe that the symphony, under Michael's direction, this was, would have been his best season if it hadn't been for his tragic accident. I mean, we were just starting to plan this year's season and we were all excited because everything was going well. We had more people in the seats and it was just, horrifying what happened. We were all uh, 
at rehearsal and uh, everybody started think thinking that um, Michael should be there at any moment and uh, he didn't come and he didn't come and right then we knew something, something had happened. We just had that feeling. It was just devastating. It was just horrible. I don't know of another word to describe it. It was, it was absolutely devastating. I was very close to Michael in many ways. Um, Michael is a very important person, and I don't think that we would have an orchestra today had it not been for Michael. I couldn't believe that a man as cautious as Michael was and as uh, careful as he was in making all of his plans could die on a highway in a single solo accident. It just didn't, uh, it didn't register. That whole last season, it was, it was a little eerie. He was, he was, we were playing pieces of music that were very spiritual. The Bruckner's Fourth Symphony was a piece of music and, and there were parts of it. The end of that symphony actually, actually the way, the way Michael told us, represented the ascension of going to heaven. And um, and it, 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 it it's just strange that that was the last piece of music that he and that was a, the last section of music that we we played with him. It did go on, and I thought that we should get a dynamic new conductor, and we have that in Peter Jaffe. When Peter showed up, we were all excited, and of course we were always all a little apprehensive. We want to know, you know, what's this guy going to be like, and uh, we knew that he had a really good smile, <laughs> and we really knew that he, we wouldn't not see him because he's so tall. The person who's conducting an orchestra it's kind of like a marriage. You, you have to get used to that person. You have to get used to that person's idiosyncrasies, their habits, uh, their whims, their senses of humor or lack of. Um, and once you really get to know them, you bond with them very strongly. And it's hard to accept putting anyone else in that person's place. So we all loved Clyde Quick is our, our conductor, and when he left, it's kind of like going through a divorce. You, there's a sense of loss or bitterness or resentment and anxiety about a new person coming. Um, but we worked through it and got to know Michael, and of course, we all love Michael. And then when we lost him, again, we all went through another transition of, of being skeptical about who could replace him. But all things uh, change, and uh, we're, we're thrilled with where, with where the orchestra's going now. Sometimes he's, he seems like just a, a big kid up there when, when he's working on a piece and, and finding a way to solve a problem and make the music sound good, and he rehearses us, and he rehearses each section and all the players. And then we come and perform it and we, we do it right and make the music the way he, you just, it's just so, so refreshing just to see the big grin and big smile on his face. Uh, how, you know, the, the joy he's developed when he, the, the joy he gets when he sees us playing well. And uh, that's infectious. I think that goes throughout the whole orchestra and makes us want to play better too. And, and not be afraid to play well and take some chances. He expects a lot from us and he gets it because we want to make him happy. That's how we feel. It's, we're just one big family. It offers, uh, for me personally, just an absolute spiritual experience. I could have had the worst day of my life, the busiest day, working too hard. I could think of a million reasons not to go to symphony. But I felt obligated to go, first off, because it's like a, members of a family. You have to show up to be there to be responsible for the other members. But as soon as I started to play, within seconds 
everything just melted away. All the problems of the day, all problems of the world stopped existing. And it's just, just for my own soul, it's just an incredible experience. When I get out of playing in the symphony, I get out a great deal of satisfaction of playing my instrument in a good orchestra and playing this awesome music. You know, as the uh, rock Monoff we did this past a uh, week or so ago at uh, Mandavi was just uh, like going to heaven. It was so good. It's a continuous joy that I get to play music uh, and that I get to play music musically rather than just playing notes. And uh, that's the joy that's in my life. It just, uh, I, I've been blessed that somehow I got started playing a cello and it's satisfying these retire, retirement years uh, enormously. It's just uh, the center of everything <laughs> and, and that's what I like. <laughs> the other thing I really like about the symphony uh, is sitting in the middle of the symphony. People in the audience, I, I feel sorry for them because they don't actually get to feel what it's like to feel the sounds right inside in the middle of the, of the symphony. Uh, the second violins are already out of his second class citizens, but we actually have the best seats in the house because we can hear the first violins to the right, we can hear the violas and cellos over to there, the winds and the brass are right behind us, and right in front of us is the conductor, and it is so magical. It is just an incredible experience. I am thrilled to be a part of it. I just can't express what it's been like 25 years of having this opportunity for somebody that loves music, loves to play, but isn't a professional musician, but can be part of this group and be proud of the music that we put out for our community. And I, I'm just thrilled. I am so excited that the orchestra is still here after 25 years, and I am absolutely positive that they'll be here another 25, that the community loves this group, and I hope everybody takes the opportunity to come see this group at least once. The things I have done in my life, the Auburn Orchestra certainly ranks as one of the proudest moments and one that I will carry with me forever. <laughs>